Today, we will be learning about Everyday Democracy's Dialogue to Change process. I hope you, that you've all had a chance to review the prep materials associated with this webinar. They provide great context for the process we're learning today. As you may have discerned from those materials, the work supported by Everyday Democracy's process is complex in comparison to what was presented during the last webinar where we learned about World Cafe, a knowledge sharing and conversation model adaptable for a wide variety of contexts. As you'll learn over the next hour and a half, Everyday Democracies is more than a conversation model. It is an accessible and rich process designed to work with complex issues. It works explicitly with a racial equity focus, and the work begins in a space where you have already identified an issue of great relevance to your community, and you're starting the work of conversation and change. Everyday Democracy's process is exciting and relevant for libraries because it builds capacity for communities to work together. The potential for libraries, we feel, is quite great, and we will be looking forward to over the next few months, for those of you that engage deeper with Everyday Democracy, to learning about how that process has worked for you and your community. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Everyday Democracy's Milana rogers Burnson, Sagacity Walker, and Richard Frieder. Sagacity Walker is Everyday Democracy's Community Assistance Associate. He's been with Everyday Democracy for three years, providing administrative and technical support to the senior associates, working directly with communities and facilitating community trainings. Sagacity is also the Administrative Assistant to the Director of Strengthening Democratic Capacity Unit and works on Everyday Democracy's evaluation and learning team where he designed and administered surveys, interviewed community leaders, and wrote reports based on program data. Milana rogers Burson is a program associate at Everyday Democracy who has worked with communities across the country providing coaching and training. Milana graduated Boston University with a BA in philosophy and political science. In addition to the teaching work she is doing with us today, Milana is mapping the work that Everyday Democracy is doing across the country and is also charged with helping young leaders to increase intergenerational learning in Everyday Democracy's network. Richard Frieder. Richard is a community engagement consultant working with community capacity builders in Hartford, Connecticut, and he is a senior associate with Everyday Democracy. He was recently named the recipient of a Community Engagement Fellowship from the Humanities Institute at the University of Connecticut. And Richard is also a librarian who is perhaps known to many of you, who served as Community Engagement Director for Hartford Public Library from 2001 until 2016. At Hartford Public, he created the Center for Civic Engagement, which won two National Innovators Awards from the Urban Libraries Council. He led a team from Hartford Public staff who participated in ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities, working with the Hartford Institute for Public Innovation, the Harvard Institute for Public Innovation. Richard is also a leader in voter engagement and neighborhood revitalization work with various Hartford organizations, including co-founding the Hartford Decides Participatory Budgeting Initiative, the first of its kind in Connecticut, for which he received the Lamplighter Award from Urban Hope Refuge Church. Most recently, Richard has been leading community dialogues in partnership with Hartford residents, the Hartford Police Department, and Hartford's faith-based initiative, focusing on community violence and strengthening community police relations. So we have quite a powerful lineup today, and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Sagacity, who will get us started. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Mary, appreciate that introduction. So uh, before we begin, I would like to say uh, thank you to ALA and PLA, thank you to Mary, thank you to Courtney and Samantha for having us today. Um, today we're gonna be talking about creating inclusive spaces for equitable community problem solving. So uh, here at Everyday Democracy, uh, what we focus on is dialogue to change programs. So the 
before I begin, I want to set the goals for today. And the first one would be making sure that everyone understands everyday democracy dialogue to change process. This is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So then that way, when you when we get to the discussion session, this discussion point of our presentation, you're all aware, and any questions that you have, we can address those. Um, and also, and so you can start to think about how this could work in your community and at your library. The next thing you want to do is make sure that everyone has an appreciation of the community engagement principles. And these are the principles that guide our work, and it pretty much describes how we work the way we work and why we work in that manner. And then next would be strategies and practices for outreach and engagement. This is um, this is so. <laughs> this is so everybody knows that um, when it comes to reaching out to communities, there's certain strategies that can be used, and in making sure with everyday democracy, we like to know that all voices are heard, respected, and honored. Then, lastly, principles of inclusion and equity. This is making sure that once we have all these different people to the table, we sure that all voices are heard and different perspectives make it into the community solution that, it, that we come up with. So then that way, everybody is actually has a voice in what is said. Um, and we're gonna do this through going through an agenda really quickly. We're gonna first talk about the traditional community engagement methods, their strengths and their weaknesses, and then we're going to talk about our dialogue process, how our process works, how we're different from traditional community engagement techniques. And then we're going to talk about the theory behind our process. Once again, that's about why we work the way we work. And then we're also going to uh, discuss some of the considerations and choices we make that separates us, our process, from other processes. And that's pretty much going to be key because what we do is focus on equity and things of that nature. And then Milana is going to get into some outcomes. That these are some possible outcomes that you can come up with and also giving real-world examples on programs that were held in the past, and that's when Richard will follow up with what the work he did at Hartford Public Library and the dialogues that they held there. Um, well, actually, he's done several different projects using the dialogue to change process, but he's just going to give examples on one. If you have any other questions, you can ask him about those during the Q&A session. And um, at the, I'd also like to say that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, and we'll be looking at those as we go through them, and we'll, um, they'll be collected, and we can answer those towards the end of our presentations. So as Sagacity said, at Everyday Democracy, we are focusing on community engagement, racial equity, and problem solving. And um, like, as Mary said, this is very complex. Um, there's many pieces and many things you have to think about to make sure that you know everybody has a voice in the community, decision-making po power, and that you're breaking down those barriers that exist already. Uh, so we want to ask you, as participants, uh, think about your own community and when problems arise, how do you see them addressed in your community? And you can write your responses in the chat. So what are, what are some of the ways that you've seen address, um, issues addressed in your community? So you see town hall meetings, um, people complaining, protests, community forums. Um, we see talking points, so educating the public about how to deal with ICE agents, community conversation. Um, city council meetings, other education methods like social media, films, discussions, so I think that, that could also be education. Um, so rights for immigrants, resist coalitions, activism, marches, rallies. Uh, so, so these are really great. Um, and you know, I'll let you to continue to write in. I think a lot of them are things that we are about to touch on and that we've, we've talked about already. So. You go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. so, um, so one way that we see you know, problems addressed in communities is the, from the top down. So this is when politicians or community leaders um, make decisions behind closed doors. They may or may not, um, they usually don't ask for community input, but if they do, the input is very limited. And 
I think this is something that we see more and more frustration, like in our local communities and also on the state and federal level um, from community members that, you know, because they feel like they don't have a say um, and, you know, they might feel like the only time that they get to actually have an opinion is when the, during elections um, or sometimes they feel like even during elections, their vote doesn't matter. So in response to the top-down approach, we also see people coming together to oppose those decisions and policies. And I saw many of you write about this activism. So, you know, people coming together to protest, direct action. And I think this is something we've also seen a lot more on the national level. So even this weekend, you know, the climate march, um, immigrant rights rallies. Today, a lot of people are striking for May Day. Um, and you know, sometimes this can be a good solution. It gives people that, that space to really voice what matters, um, you know, have their voice kind of amplified in a different way. And, you know, sometimes protests and direct action can change laws. Uh, but we also want to create action and community change that really becomes embedded and where, you know, those voices can remain central kind of throughout the community um, every day. And so rather than being reactive, also being proactive. And I also saw a lot of people write town hall meetings, council meetings, community meetings. Um, so, you know, town hall meetings is a way that towns and cities have figured out to have community members be able to voice their opinions um, where legislators are often in the room. And so, you know, this is as, as much as this kind of gives people that space, it's also, we don't think that the format is necessarily conducive for real community input and change. So people are often, you know, only giving three minutes to really say their opinion, um, say what they care about. You know, often they get to be angry for those three minutes, but there's not a lot of room for actual dialogue between community members or um, with the legislators, with the politicians. and. Also, we see that a lot of times at town hall meetings, you know, the same people are getting up and speaking, the people who feel the most comfortable uh, speaking in public, or they feel like they're already a leader and that their opinion matters. And so we really want to create a space where everybody gets a chance to dialogue together and also everybody can voice their opinion regardless of how confident they feel. So, you know, we think there's a different way to solve problems that really brings together all different voices and moves people to take action. And I want to start by telling you a story that I think demonstrates how our approach works. Um, in 2010, we had an initiative called Strong Starts for Children, and that was focused on early childhood education. Um, we worked in five communities in New Mexico. and. This slide shows one of the communities. It's called Pajarito Mesa, and it's a very small rural community in New Mexico, um, only 1,500 residents, um, a lot of immigrants from Mexico and Central America, and also it's a community that wasn't recognized as, the, as part of the Albuquerque infrastructure. So they actually have faced barriers like no electricity, no running water, um, no paved or named roads. Um, there were no shelters for children who were getting dropped off um, by the school bus and also, you know, racism and prejudice towards Latin American immigrants. So they decided to have dialogues. Um, they were focusing on early childhood and they were able to recruit 70 people to participate in those dialogues. Um, so for a community of 1,500, that's a big percentage of people in the dialogues. Um, and they spent a lot of time organizing to make sure that those people got to the table make sure that they're reaching the most marginalized um, and diverse voices. And so through the dialogue, they were able to build relationships, build trust, and talk about all those barriers that I mentioned that exist. Um, and you can go to the next one. So they, and through that, they were able to come up with some action ideas and actually had some success. Um, so here's some of the things that they were able to accomplish. Um, they, they got the county commissioner's office to donate a portable building for children, so that was used as a youth space, and they actually were able to hold a youth program there as well. Um, so people, when children were getting off the bus, they had a place to, to be, you know, if it was raining, if their parents didn't pick them up right away, and a safe space as well. Um, they were also able to work with the emergency services um, 
county emergency services um, to figure out a way so that GPS could better identify the dirt roads and so they could respond to emergencies more promptly. And, and the third thing is that they were, they actually decided to do another round of dialogues, um, this time with the landowners. And so this was an opportunity for the residents to actually get to give, um, to talk with landowners about how they wanted to see development happen. So looking at this example, um, here's how we see, you know, how this, why this approach works. Um, so, you know, the inclusion of many voices, we talked about, you know, having a lot of different organizations um, at the table, making sure that, you know, I see the question in the chat, um, who started the initiative? And so in, in many of our initiatives, like it's a coalition of different groups and community members who are coming together to make this happen. So um, they actually in the decided to come up with a 501c3 kind of out of the initiative, but it was a coalition of, of lots of different groups who put this on um, and including, you know, all of those 70 people who came to the table. They built relationships. Um, they were able to build the capacity to continue the process. So to be able to, um, you know, do another round of dialogues with the landowners and also building in racial equity. Um, so talking about those barriers based on race, um, but also based on, you know, poverty. They had a, a lack of infrastructure there. Okay, so um, beginning now, we want to talk about equity versus equality. Here at Everyday Democracy, we like to use what we call an equity lens. And when we say an equity lens, what we're really talking about is making sure that people have the resources that they need, and it's not just what some people would call equality. And we like to use this picture to illustrate that. As you can see in the box, in the in the picture, that all three children have the same size box, and that would be equality, but the smallest child doesn't necessarily need one, he actually needs two to be able to see over the fence. Uh, just to clear some misconceptions about equity, beginning is um, equity does not equal diversity. Uh, diversity is just when you have a variety of people at the table, different types of people at the table. Equity is taking it a step further and making sure that, you know, the methods we use to get the people at the table are reaching out to them in the most effective way. And when they do come to the table, are we listening to them? How are we listening to them? And are we making this a safe and comfortable space for them to want to actually stay at the table? That's where equity, equity comes into play. Um, I already mentioned how equi equity is not the same as equality and how equity actually leads into fairness and justice and being honest and intentional about, you know, reaching this form of justice and making sure that everybody has the resources and opportunities that they need and not just the resources and opportunities that we would think that they would need. This diagram right here is a very quick um, glance at how the dialogue to action process actually works. So when we break down our dialogue process, we like to break it down into three main stages. And the first stage would be organizing, as you see at the top, and then we move to dialogues, and then we move to action, and after action, that is what creates the change within the community. So, you know, a really quick, you know, in part of the elevator speech that we give about everyday democracy's process, we say we do organizing, dialogues, then move to action. And the action creates community change. So I want to get into this a little bit more in the next slide, and Richard's going to be giving some concrete examples about how the process actually works. But in a nutshell, just remember that the process is about organizing, holding dialogues, and moving towards action. So here is how it works. Um, I'm going to break this down into steps, and the next the next couple of, couple of slides are going to actually describe them a little bit more in depth. But I believe you all received this graphic as well. If not, let us know. We can send that to you. Um, this breaks it down into steps. So organizing requires or uh, getting getting the organizing team together, getting facilitators together, and recruiting people. The dialogue, as you can see in the middle. There are several circles in there, and those are to represent the dialogue circles where people are coming together and having these community conversations. And you could have as few as two and three, and you could have as many as, you know, 10 to 15 or so, depending on how many people that you have involved in your capacity to actually manage that many groups. And then action, we look at action in three different uh, ways, and Milana will be getting into that later on. 
So a little bit about organizing. The steps of organizing will go pretty much. You first build a coalition of community partners. Milana mentioned this earlier, and that's just to make sure that you have as many organizations and people on board to provide you the resources that you need, whether it be funding, a space to actually hold the dialogues, things of that nature. And then you're going to want to recruit an organizing team. The organizing team's role is to make sure that they plan the dialogues and that they set goals and they set you on the correct path so then that way when you're actually doing the dialogues, everything runs smoothly. And they're also responsible for recruiting the participants and the facilitators for these dialogue circles. And what we do for the organizing team to make sure that this all goes smoothly is we provide a full day organizing training and that covers everything from recruitment uh, to how you want to evaluate your dialogue program. We also infuse an equity lens into the training so then that way everybody is on the same page about the way the process works, the importance of equity, especially racial equity, and how we can recruit and things of that nature. And how do you want to, you know, pitch this while you are recruiting people? And the next thing we do once you have a group of facilitators dedicated is we go and do another all-day training, which is for facilitators, and we train them on neutral facilitation. I'm going to talk about neutral facilitation in the next couple of slides, but very quickly, each dialogue circle is facilitated by two facilitators, and what their, their role is to make sure that the conversation moves forward. Really quickly on how long it could take to organize, it's a very intensive process, and it can take uh, four to six months is about the average, but we've also seen it where it can take up to a year to get going, and we've also seen it get moving in about a month or so. It really depends on uh, a community's ability to recruit participants, to recruit facilitators, and to get people moving and get people on board. If you get going and you know you have a good idea, but you don't necessarily have the resources or the partners, that may take you a longer time to get moving. But if you have a good idea and you already have a larger network built up and it's just about reaching out to people, then it could take a much shorter time. So that's the organizing phase in a nutshell. And um, what we're going to talk about for the dialogue section is one of the reasons why it works is because we value face-to-face -face conversations. And the thing about face-to-face -face conversations and why it works is because nowadays with technology, Facebook, Twitter, uh, I don't know, Snapchat, and I'm not really big on all of the big social media things, but a lot of people, other people use it. I'm not that cool. So when a lot of people are using all these social media and we have these different conversations, I even think somebody mentioned, you know, closed chat rooms on social media. Um, what happens is we get so tied up into having conversations or talking at people that we don't usually talk with people or have a conversation, a nice cordial back and forth with one another. So what we do is we focus on having real people meeting in real time discussing these real issues. Um, uh, it's more of a, how we wrote it here was it's a gift to sit down and talk to each other face to face because as the more connected we become, it also seems as like the more disconnected we become. And that's part of the reason why we have these facilitators doing, uh, facilitating the dialogue circles. Um, I mentioned earlier that when we have facilitators, we practice what we call a neutral facilitation. So really quickly, um, I just want to get an idea of what is that you all think neutral facilitation actually means. So I'll give you a second to uh, write in what you think neutral facilitation is. What do we mean when we say neutral facilitation? Great, great. I see not having an opinion, not taking sides, no bias. A lot of these. Great. Doesn't have a dog in the fight. I always like that uh, <laughs> colloquialism. Um, yes, not inserting your own opinion. No judgment. That's a big one. Using active listening skills, that is definitely a part of our facilitator training. Yes, not expressing support or for a specific position. Great, great. And not steering the conversation. Excellent, excellent. All right, that, that's pretty much, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things that go hand in hand with neutral facilitation. I appreciate that. And it is a very difficult skill to do. Um, so um, what we, so as you guys had just been writing, neutral facilitation, it does mean that we do not take sides in, with any participant. If one person says something, whether we agree with it or not, our role is not to actually say, yes, you are right, or no, you are wrong, things of that nature. It's just about moving the conversation forward, even though I'm not part of the conversation. My personal views and perspectives do not belong within the dialogue circle if I am a facilitator. 
And yes, somebody just wrote in uh, process focus. It is about making sure that the process continues to move forward. When um, I want to talk about it in a little bit. When we use our discussion guides to actually form the dialogue circles, you know, um, and it pretty much is the schedule that we work by, is just making sure that we're hitting all the points that we need to hit and that everybody in the circle is actually having their voices heard. So at the last bullet point is all perspectives are heard and respected. Um, is to make sure that everybody, the people who may be a little bit quiet or the people who may not, who may not be used to having their voices heard and respected in a space so they stay quiet, we make sure we get everyone speaking to one another. Again, that's to one another, not at each other. Yeah, so that's neutral facilitation. I appreciate your answers. So going back to um, once we have the neutral facilitators set up and they're all trained and they're ready to go and you have people signed up as dialogue participants, this is what a dialogue circle actually looks like. We look for 10 to 12 participants to be involved and we want to shoot for diversity. By diversity, we're talking about gender, age, race, ethnicity, things of that nature. And each dialogue circle, like I mentioned before, is based on a discussion guide. Most discussion guides are about six sessions, and each session is two hours, which is the reason why we say we meet weekly. So that's one session a week, two hours, and then you can meet up to six weeks. And the first couple of sessions actually focus on relationship building. Again, this is one of those things that separates our process from a lot of other community engagement processes is we're in very intentional, not just about equity, but also about building relationships with one another. You get closer to your community members and your, you know, your neighbors and such by seeing them over a six week period, a couple of hours than you would by just one community meeting that you sat down and everybody aired their grievances over one hour period. So the first couple of sessions are about relationship building and everyone is talking about where they live, where they're from, what they like about the community, what they don't like, things of that nature, like, and just get all of that out so we all get to know one another as individuals. Then the next couple of sessions we'll be talking about the actual issue and framing the issue, how it relates to us, um, how we've been affected by the issue. Then the last couple of sessions is coming up with some sort of action process or a solution to how we want to address that issue. And because we've gotten to know one another, by the time we get to solutions, we're more apt to listen to other people's perspectives and how their opinion has a role in why they think we should address the issue in one particular way. Even though we may not have agreed with it a couple of weeks ago because we've gotten to know this person and gotten to know how the issue affected them, we're more apt to listen and less apt to ignore what other people are saying. All right, so a big part of our process, if you look at the, the diagram that we sent you all, is action. And we think it's really important that, you know, dialogue leads to action and that it's not just talking um, to talk um, because communities are facing real problems and we want to come up with solutions. And so we talk about action on three different levels, the individual level, uh, the collective or community level, and also the institutional level. And so. Um, we see, you know, people come up with action ideas on those different levels, but also we see results that come out of the dialogue just, just from being there and just from being a part of that process. So um, here are some of the results that we see just from the process, um, being able to have that space to have difficult, have conversation about difficult issues. So, you know, often people are talking about topics like racism, they're talking about poverty, maybe community police relations where, you know, community and police are talking to each other. And so it's giving you a format to, to have those difficult conversations and make sure that they're actually productive. Um, you, we get to hear from community members who usually don't have a voice um, because the process and because it's a, they're small circles and we have the facilitators, there's a lot of intentionality about making sure that everyone in that circle gets a chance to speak, gets a chance to tell their own story. And through this kind of trust building, relationship building, a lot of uh, tensions are diffused. So people might hear stories from somebody else who doesn't have the same uh, opinion or viewpoint as they might have, but because they get to hear their story and because they're talking from their own experience, a lot of times it does diffuse those tensions. So on the individual level, um, so we talked about, you know, dispelling stereotypes that you might have about people from a different group. Um, also, you know, building those deeper relationships with people. So, you know, people might meet their neighbors for the first time. Uh, and 
also learning from each other. So, you know, we really emphasize that you don't need to have an expert in the room and you don't necessarily need to have um, all of the facts presented to people. It's really a chance for people to talk from their own experience. And so you get to kind of see everybody's own ex expertise and learn from each other and grow. And also seeing new leaders emerge. So um, we have worked a lot in the Northwest states on poverty and um, in one community, Boulder, Montana, which is a small city, they went through a series of dialogues on poverty and building prosperity. And there was one person in the dialogue um, who actually hadn't seen himself as a leader before, but from these dialogues decided to run for mayor and won. So the second kind of action we talk about is collective action. So um, here's some examples of that. This is when communities actually come together to take on a project. And so they don't actually need necessarily need community leaders involved for this process, but they might, might need them to be involved. Um, so some examples are community gardens, multicultural centers, neighborhood cleanups, um, trust building forums between police and youth. And here's another example. So in a small community in South Dakota, they were also addressing poverty. Um, they noticed that a lot of the youth in that neighborhood were getting into trouble. Uh, and so they, they decided they wanted to have a youth center um, to provide a space where youth could have a place to spend time with each other, um, but also have a safe environment. And in one of the circles, there was somebody who had an old car dealership um, that had gone out of business. And he actually offered to donate the space for this youth center. So I think this, this story really demonstrates how the relationship building is really important and how kind of identifying those assets, the assets that you might not see as assets um, at the beginning, um, and kind of building those relationships so that people are sharing the resources that they have and the assets that they, they themselves have to, um, to overcome economic barriers. So this was a very poor community, and they were able to leave that dialogue circle with a very concrete step and with some of the resources to actually make it happen. And so the last form um, of change that we talk about is institutional and policy change. And this is um, the hardest form of change and also the one that takes the longest to achieve. So, you know, when we have people brainstorm action ideas, we, we tell them to kind of brainstorm some ideas that you can make an impact short term and then some that would be long term. Um, and so this, these would most likely be long term. Um, and so I'll give you another example on this. So in 2010, we had um, in New York City, there's a nonprofit that wanted to hold dialogues on food and health disparities. And so they were able to recruit 150 people to come out for a day long community conversation. And it was, so it was started by the nonprofit, but they worked in collaboration with faith institutions, city leaders, the mayor's office, neighborhood residents, and also food workers to make this happen. And they focus specifically on building, you know, equity, racial equity, economic equity in terms of access to healthy and affordable food. Um, and so one of the things they did was by working with the mayor's office, they were able to get the mayor's office to agree to incorporate all of the action ideas into Plan YC, which is a long-term sustainability plan that affects the entire city. So, you know, right off the bat, um, all of those action ideas were, you know, were valued in some way. And, um, led to policy decisions. And then they were also formed action teams out of the process. And so one action team was focused on educating people around legislation that was related to food. Um, another is de was developing incentives for people to make healthy food choices. And they had other teams that were educating people about nutrition, about eating, about cooking. Um, so each form of each of these forms of action and change is really important to actually embedding this equity, embedding democratic principles. And so we really encourage people to brainstorm actions on all of these different levels and, um, and make sure that, you know, you're including everyone's voice in those action ideas in order to make positive change that impacts everybody. Um, so, go to the next. so we now want to talk specifically about how your work um, your library can work to make community change. And we want you to think a little bit, again, about your own community. So if you were to use this process, what community issues would you like to address? So 
So what, what community issues are you facing? The lack of social services, affordable housing, um, affordable housing again. So development, it looks like the dead downtown, police brutality, hunger, racism, um, education. We have drug abuse, addiction, uh, gentrification again, climate change, development, uh, homelessness, racial divide. So these are all really important issues and um, we've, been, we've seen that this process can work with a lot of different issues, um, you know, probably any issue that your community faces and we, we help the community think about how to kind of frame the issue so that it really um, relates to all, everybody in the community. Um, but, you know, all of these issues I think are really important and we've, we've been able to see successful dialogues on really, you know, large public issues. So um, I want to thank you for, for thinking about that question and um, I want to pass this to Richard Frieder. Um, our, one of our senior associates, and he will talk about how the Hartford Public Library used dialogue to change. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Milana and Sagacity. Uh, we're just doing a little shift in here. Okay, because we're all physically in the same room, arm to arm. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time, as Milana said, talking about uh, how this dialogue to change um, process can be used in libraries. And I'll talk about my experience at Hartford Public Library, which I'll refer to as HPL. Uh, by the way, we do see that some questions have come in and, and we will get to those. Um, I'm going to spend a little time sharing my experience with you and then, and then we're going to open it up, but we'll try to leave plenty of time for that. Um, so I was the community engagement director at HPL for 15 years until about a year ago. Um, and uh, I don't work there anymore, but I did use the dialogue to change process a number of times while I was there and I've continued to do dialogue work since leaving HPL, uh, both with Everyday Democracy and on my own under the name Community Capacity Builders. So let me talk for a minute about how we got started with dialogues. Um, we had been doing uh, public programming on a whole variety of community issues, as I'm sure many of your libraries are, and it was going well. Uh, we had good programs, um, good information, good discussion. We had usually a good turnout. People were enthused, um, and, uh, but then they would go home, and I found myself uh, wondering what happened uh, after they went home and wondering, uh, were we making a difference? Um, so I was thinking about this over a period of time and I came to realize that what I really wanted to find um, was a way for, to help people and communities get to action, but action of their choosing, and these are very important words, of their own choosing for libraries because of course it's not our job um, to tell people what action to take or how they should take it. Um, and also something that would help get to community-driven change. And the words community-driven are also very important because uh, real change usually comes from the community, not from someone telling them what to do, whether it's the library or the government or somebody else. So it was around that time that I met somebody from Everyday Democracy and uh, learned about this dialogue to change process that Milana and Sagacity have um, been telling us about. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is it. This is what I was looking for, uh, a way to help people get to action of their choosing and achieve positive community-driven change. So I was really excited. I felt that we had found a way to make sure that we were, in fact, making a difference. And I felt that libraries would be a natural for this uh, because we were so highly trusted um, and uh, convening people is just a natural part of what we do and because we tend to have great relationships throughout the communities that we serve. So we did our first dialogue in 2009, and we went on to do a number more while I was there, and I'm gonna tell you about uh, one of them today. Um, so here's how it worked at Hartford Public Library. Uh, and I'm gonna use this diagram um, that, that you've seen already and that you've got in advance. And again, it has the three basic uh, sections, organized dialogue and action. 
Um, and I'm going to go through each of them briefly, and I'm going to start with the organize uh, side of the diagram, and we'll start with setting goals. So in 2010, HPL received a grant from IMLS, Institute for Museum and Library Services, for an immigrant civic engagement project. Um, and we decided to incorporate community dialogues as part of the project. Um, Hartford has a large immigrant and refugee community, uh, and we wanted to offer them something that would help them become engaged in the community and would help the receiving community get to know the newcomers. Um, this term, receiving community, is one that I've never liked and never been comfortable with, but I don't have a better one. So I'm going to use it today. And basically, it's referring to the non-immigrant um, part of the population. So we had these two goals for, the, for including community dialogues in this project. We wanted to um, provide an opportunity to build relationships between immigrants and the receiving community, and also to encourage these two communities to work together towards action. Uh, so we thought the dialogue to change process um, would be a perfect fit for this. So then we went about developing a plan for action. Um, first, we had to think about, did we want partners? And if so, who would they be? And after thinking about it a bit, we decided to um, approach the Hartford Public Schools uh, and a few immigrant groups and the Asylum Hill NRZ uh, to be our partners. Asylum Hill is a neighborhood in Hartford that has um, a large immigrant and refugee population. And an NRZ is a neighborhood revitalization zone. There, there is an NRZ in almost every neighborhood in Hartford. So um, all of these partners we knew uh, would have goals similar to our own, but also something they had that was really key in choosing them to be our partners was that each of them had an extensive network in the community. Um, so they all agreed to work with us. And we went about choosing a topic, a dialogue. Um, in the process of doing this, we did a survey of some immigrants and some other people in the neighborhood. Um, and we settled on the topic of adult learning and adult education. And more specifically, the title that we chose for the dialogue was uh, Creating a Vibrant Hartford, Adult Learning as a Pathway to Change. We decided to have dialogue circles meet once a week for four weeks. Um, and we took this multi-session approach because part of the goal was to build relationships, and, and Milana and Sagacity talked about this, um, but also um, four to us was a good balance, and, and I saw a question come in about this. We can talk more about it later. Um, you want to have enough sessions to accomplish the goal of building relationships, but not so many that people aren't going to come back. Uh, so four, uh, four sessions felt to us like a good, a good number. Um, we then developed a discussion guide, and Sagacity talked about this. It's sort of a roadmap um, to help guide the dialogue. And there are many examples of discussion guides on the Everyday Democracy website. Here are a few um, examples, and I think we had sent out the link to the website. It, it's up in the chat box now. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, I recommend you go take a look at some of the discussion guides. So, moving on to the process of recruiting participants and facilitators, um, first we held an informational meeting to start building interest. Uh, we sent out a general announcement, and we talked with people and groups that we thought might be interested, and we had about 30 people come to this informational meeting. And at that meeting, uh, we explained the process, we did a sample dialogue, um, which is a mini version of a dialogue, you can do it in, in an hour. Um, just to give people a taste, sort of modeling the dialogue process. And I would highly recommend uh, doing a sample dialogue. Um, the, the concept of a community dialogue sometimes is a little difficult for people to really grasp, but doing a sample dialogue um, really helps them understand it. And uh, usually people become very enthusiastic, which was the case at this informational meeting, and almost everybody there signed up for the full dialogue. Um, so we then worked uh, with our partners to develop a recruitment plan, and uh, this is where uh, it's important that each partner had its own network. I talked about that a minute ago. That's part of how we chose our partners. 
So we capitalized on each partner's network, um, but also we identified um, what I call community connectors, and these are people who are in every community. I'm sure you know some in communities. There, there are influencers. There are people that other people listen to. So um, we worked with our partners and with community connectors to um, build participation for the full dialogue. Now, we wanted to be inclusive, um, as was talked about earlier. Uh, we were trying to reach both the immigrant community and the receiving community, and we wanted all voices to be included, uh, and especially those that are usually not heard or marginalized. And uh, generally, and I'll talk a little more about this later, um, the more diversity, uh, the better the process works. Um, we also started recruiting facilitators, and Sagacity talked quite a bit about facilitators, so I won't say too much, um, but we, uh, we gathered together a group of people who wanted to be facilitators, and then we offered a facilitator training, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then finally, in this part of the process, we created an organizing committee and a communications committee, both of which played critical roles. Uh, the organizing committee serves as sort of the driving force in planning and carrying out the dialogue, and the communications committee uh, coordinated recruitment and publicity. And just like with facilitators, the membership of, of these committees should reflect the community that you're working on. So a week or so before the dialogue circle started meeting, we held a facilitator training. It was a, a day long, and um, we uh, really focused on the facilitators because they do play a critical role in, in the process. They guide the dialogue, uh, they make sure the process is inclusive, um, and that all of the dialogue circles develop action ideas, which is very important, and action ideas that can later be presented at the action forum. So in the training, we covered basic facilitation skills, talked about that issue of neutrality, uh, we emphasized how to help the circles get to action ideas, and especially action ideas that are practical and attainable. And then we provided an opportunity for the facilitators to practice, because we wanted to make sure that they felt ready. Um, and the last thing we did at the facilitator training was that we created teams of facilitators, and Sassy talked about this earlier too. Usually facilitators work in, in teams of two, um, and among other things, this gives you a chance to team up more experienced people with less experience, but also to have some diversity um, among your facilitators. So having done all of this, we were ready for the kickoff event. And the purpose of the kickoff is to attract participants, build support, and create buzz. So we publicized this widely, just like we had done for the informational medium, but on a larger scale. And we had about 100 or 125 people um, come to the meeting. Um, and uh, at the meeting, we reviewed the goals, we reviewed, reviewed the process. We heard from a couple of inspirational speakers, including the mayor and another one or two community leaders. We again did a sample dialogue, but this time with 100 or more people rather than with uh, 20 or 30 uh, at the informational meeting. And after we did the sample dialogue, we had a call to action of signing people up for the dialogue. And most of, most of the people there did sign up for the dialogue. Um, and then we had a conversation about who was missing from the table. Again, this, uh, to us at Everyday Democracy, essential issue about equity and uh, making sure to include voices that are not usually heard. Um, and then we just covered next steps to make sure that everybody knew uh, when and where the dialogue circles would begin. So um, that is the organizing process. And now um, uh, that took about four to five months. And again, as Sagacity said earlier, and we can talk about this later if you're interested, it can be done in less. It sometimes takes more time than that. Um, but it kind of depends how you do it. Um, so we're going to move on to the dialogue process now. And um, based on the number of people that had signed up for the dialogue, um, we had about seven dialogue circles. Uh, so we had about 80 people involved altogether. Um, and we had them meet at different times to allow for people's schedules. Uh, most of them met at the Central Library, but a couple met in other locations. And each of them used the discussion guide. Um, 
Now we move on to the action part of the process. I'll talk about the action forum in just a minute. I do just want to make note of what uh, Milana talked about earlier. There are, as you see in the diagram, different kinds of action, and they're all really important. Uh, I'm going to focus here on collective action. Um, so after completing our dialogue process, each dialogue circle had developed a number of action ideas, and then we held an action forum on a Saturday. I, if I remember correctly, it was about a three hour long event, two and a half hours. Um, we invited all dialogue circle members. We also invited anyone who had been involved along the way, whether it was the informational meeting or the kickoff event, and other people we thought would be interested in the topic. And we had about 100 people in the room. Um, so at this action forum, each dialogue circle reported out on their recommended action ideas. Um, and we had, we put them all up on flip charts. There were 20 or 30 ideas altogether. And then we set priorities by doing a dot exercise, which probably everybody on this webinar has done. Uh, when you get three or four or five colored sticky dots and you uh, vote using your sticky dots. So people walked around the room and voted with their sticky dots on the flip charts. And uh, by doing that, we boiled it down to basically four ideas. In some cases, we combined some ideas. Um, but we had four ideas, and then we formed an action team for each of these these ideas. Um, four is a, is a good number for action teams. If, if you have too many more than that, it can get really unwieldy. Uh, the very first dialogue I ever did, we created eight action teams, and that, that became very messy. Um, four, four is a pretty good number. So then we gave everybody in the room the opportunity to join the action team that most interested them, and about half the people uh, who were present signed up for an action team. And the action teams then had their first meeting right there in the room. Uh, didn't have a lot of time, but it was enough time for them to talk briefly, decide on who would be initially a point person, and exchange contact information, and set a date and a time for the next meeting. Um, and then we reviewed the timeline for the action teams to do their work. So the four action teams met for a period of months, and we worked with them, especially in the beginning, to help them get going. Um, we also held occasional joint meetings of all of the action teams together, and these were very valuable. Uh, it gave them a chance to hear what each other was doing and to brainstorm with each other and to avoid duplication and in some cases see where they might collaborate. And this is the flyer, the action forum flyer that we use to promote the action forum. So after several months, um, there were two great examples of um, collective action uh, and community change that came out of the action teams, um, and I'm going to share them with you briefly. Um, on the left is something from the Hartford Time Bank, also known as the Hartford Hour Exchange. Uh, some of you may be familiar with time banks. I think there are a few hundred time banks in the country. Um, it's a great concept. It's sort of like bartering, but, it, but I think it's even better than bartering. Um, people can exchange services with no money involved, and, and each member has an online account where they can manage their deposits and withdrawals of time credits. Uh, it's also a great way of building relationships and building community. Um, the action team focused on this idea because uh, they thought it would be a good way for people in the community, whether immigrants or receiving community or others, to exchange services uh, like tutoring, transportation, cooking lessons, and, and other kinds of services, while also building relationships and building community. And because there's no money involved, low-income people would not be excluded. The other example is on the right side of the screen, uh, the Asylum Hill Welcoming Committee. Again, Asylum Hill was the neighborhood where uh, we were focusing, not exclusively, but to a large degree. And as a result of the dialogue, the Asylum Hill NRZ decided to create a welcoming committee uh, for the purpose of bringing together immigrants, refugees, and the receiving community to work on community issues on an ongoing basis. And the Welcome Committee has, has been very successful. They recently opened a multicultural center, which is the flyer that you see on the right, um, advertising or promoting some of the things that they offer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they've also done a number of other things, one of which to have this public program 
called New Voices of Asylum Hill, and I think we had sent the link out to you earlier of the, the um, recording of that program where refugees teamed up with people from the receiving community to tell their stories both in their native language and in English, and it really is. Honestly, it brought me to tears, and, I, and uh, I, I hope some of you had a chance to watch that program, or if you haven't, I recommend it. So that's what we did at HPL with the Dialogue to Change process. Um, we did accomplish our goals. Remember uh, what I said earlier, we wanted to provide an opportunity uh, to build relationships between immigrants and the receiving community and encourage them to work together towards action, and the Dialogue accomplished that. Um, and as I said earlier, I think libraries are a great fit for this kind of work because we're so highly trusted and uh, a natural convener and we have great relationships. Um, so if your library has not already done this work, I would really urge you to give it a try. Um, it's a great way to help make your communities even better than they are and to establish your library as a change agent um, in the community. So I'm gonna wrap up with a few lessons learned. Um, and these are lessons learned both from the dialogue I just described and from just my experience over the past several years with dialogues. <coughs> Excuse me. The first is um, choose a topic that people are passionate about. Um, this ensures good participation um, and increases the chance that people will come back for multiple sessions. Um, and I know one of you had asked about this. Uh, or you can let the community choose the topic. Um, they will be sure to choose something that they really care about. The second is um, recruiting is essential and it's worth as much time as you can give it. Recruiting participants is, is basically the fuel that drives the engine of the dialogue to change process. And um, as I said earlier, something that I have learned in doing this work is that uh, the more diversity, the better the process works. And I'm talking not only about skin color, but um, age, religion, perspective, all kinds of um, diversity. Uh, really, the, the more diversity there is among the participants, the better the process is gonna work. It takes extra effort to bring in a great diversity of people and especially to include the marginalized voices. And this is something that can easily get shortchanged in the process because you, uh, you get in a rush and you have deadlines and um, this often will not get the attention it needs. So uh, I urge you to allow enough time in your planning process uh, for recruitment. Um, the third is that the process is just as valuable as the product. Um, this work is not just about action. This was a real lesson for me. It took me a while to learn this because I came into this work very oriented towards action and collective action in particular. Um, but what I learned was that in some ways the process is the product or it's part of the product. Uh, the sharing of perspectives, the building relationships, finding common ground, all of that in itself is an important part of the product. And next is there are different kinds of action and they all have value. And Milana covered this earlier, so I won't um, say much more about it, but uh, it's an important point. Um, all of these kinds of action are really valuable and important. Um, Fifth is the transition from dialogue to action teams is critical and it, it can be somewhat delicate. Uh, don't let action teams leave the action forum without having their first meeting and getting straight on uh, who the initial point person is, setting a time for the next meeting, getting contact information. Um, if you don't do this, I can pretty much guarantee that you'll have a mess on your hands. And finally, um, action teams often need some nurturing. Um, they're not likely successful if left entirely on their own right from the beginning. If you, if you form the action teams and then basically say to them, okay, off you go, good luck, uh, uh, some of them are not gonna make it. It, it. There's a lot of variables involved, but in some cases, none of them will make it if you don't um, help them. Uh, in other cases, some will make it, but uh, be ready to help them along. Um, and this also should be taken into account when you're planning your time and your resources. So I'm gonna end it there. Um, we're looking forward to your questions and having some discussion in the remaining time. And thanks for your attention. I'm gonna turn it back over to Milana. All right, so um, we're gonna take questions now. And I know Samantha has been collecting those questions and she's gonna feed them to us. So I'll hand it over to Samantha from ALA. Great, thank you 
all. This was a really great presentation. So we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions, and I've been collecting those. So I'm going to actually summarize one that we've been getting quite often about facilitators. Um, could you speak a little bit more about how facilitators are recruited, if they're trained, are they from community like participants, um, and what role does the library play? Can start and then you want to talk about well, uh, okay, we're, we're going to have a group approach to answering questions, so I'll, uh, this is Richard, I'll start on this one. Um, well, what role does the library play? The, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to do this kind of dialogue to change approach, um, you really have to have partners. So um, something like rec recruiting facilitators is something that usually the partners would, would do together. Uh, again, each partner generally will have its own network that can be drawn upon. So um, the library may know some people who are interested in being facilitators. Uh, in, in the example I just gave, the Hartford Public Schools knew some people who were interested, and the NRZ knew some people. So it was really kind of a group effort. Um, that was one part of the question. What, can you remind me what were the Training. others? The training, well, I, um, I talked a little about the facilitator training. You, um, you definitely want to have a facilitator training session. You want to do it not too long before the dialogue circles start meeting, because people will forget, but ideally about a week before. Um, and, I, and I went through kind of the ingredients of the, uh, of the training session. And I can say that, so the training is something that we actually offer as Everyday Democracy if a community decides to engage in this process. Um, we have senior associates all over the country who do those trainings and provide coaching, but we're also hoping that the community will kind of build capacity within themselves to be able to train facilitators ongoing if they want to continue to do that. Uh, the training is usually it's about a day-long training um, that kind of covers everything that people need to know. Um, as Richard said, you don't need to have experience to be a facilitator, but we do give um, the organizers some advice as to like who to recruit for facilitators. So for example, we've seen um, teachers be good facilitators. There might be people who have some previous training in facilitation or social workers or, you know, people or just generally people who have good listening skills, um, community members and, and, you know, making sure that those people are diverse. Um, but also kind of not overlooking, you know, someone just because they don't have that expertise or they don't have that formal education, like making sure that, you know, those, that, you know, it's really about the skill and how somebody is able to, how much they're able to really be neutral and be a good listener and, and guide the conversation. So we've also encouraged communities to train youth as facilitators because we've seen that youth, um, in particular, like high school age, college age, have been um, really good facilitators as well. Um, so we've done facilitator training specifically for youth. Um, uh, no, just um, just to add on to that, this is Sagacity, just to add on to that, when it comes to the facilitator training that Everyday Democracy provides, um, Milana did touch on this, and Richard did in, during his presentation, is Everyday Democracy, we are about building the capacity of the community. So you, um, say for your first round of dialogues, if you're only gonna do it, for the first time you're actually doing it, we can go in, do a facilitator training with a small group of people. But moving forward, um, you can take you can take control and ha and we can go back and do what we call like a train the trainer, which is making sure that there is you know a group of people like five or so who are saying you know we will be able to train other community members to do this. So then that way you can do dialogues on an ongoing basis and have community members actually do the training for other community members to be facilitators. And and the last thing I'll say is I think somebody had talked about neutrality and so say a community member doesn't want to um, use neutrality in their facilitation and so we usually tell people when they come to the training that just coming to the training you're getting those skills you know you're getting you may even get like a certificate after um, if the community gives that out and so they're they're learning something from the training, and often it's for no cost. Um, but that there's no guarantee that they'll necessarily be a facilitator. So, for example, if you recruit 
you know, 20 facilitators and then there's only 50 p dialogue participants, then you might only have five circles. So you wouldn't necessarily need all those people. Um, so that's a way to kind of gauge through the training as well, kind of get, let people practice, gauge whether people are necessarily the right person to be a facilitator. And then you can call on people as needed and kind of given like the, you know, and you can also pair people up based on experience. So for example, having somebody who, you know, seems like they're, maybe more skilled at facilitation with somebody who might be struggling a little bit more. Great, thank you all. Um, so here's a rather specific one. How does the library accommodate and justify time and resources to do this type of training and um, dialogue process? Well, um, I think I personally think it's inherent in uh, the mission of libraries, especially public libraries, to um, to become engaged uh, with the community um, and uh, become change agents and uh, community problem solvers, work, working with other people. So <clears throat> I think it's just inherently part of the mission. Um, it does take resources. I, I think that the leadership has to be there to, to make this a high enough priority to allocate some resources to this kind of work. Um, but also, I, generally speaking, this kind of work can't be done um, in a vacuum. It can't be done individually. So there are, there are reasons that you both have to and want to work with partners. Uh, working with partners can, can reduce the burden on any one of them to come up with all of the time and resources to make to make the work happen. So I think it comes down to mission and leadership um, and spreading the work among partners. Great, thanks Richard. Um, so this one's for Mary. Um, how do I get feedback from the community to choose and frame issues? I'm sorry, who's, who's who, that was that? For? You said that was for Mary? Um, yeah. Feedback from the community to choose and frame issues. So I'm probably going to hand this to Richard, but I can definitely say in terms of looking for a model to, def, you know, choose issues and filter issues and sort of do the, that pre-work, you, you certainly will find um, many resources on the ala.org slash LTC uh, pages that speak to that. There are many models and um, also processes, um, certainly the Harwood turning outward um, process, um, even the sort of convening model that we went through in the last webinar that is just World Cafe is one that could be brought to bear with that. But let me pass this to Richard, um, who has actually done this work in his library, uh, to weigh in on this, please. Okay, so I'm sorry, the question is how to, how to get feedback from the community? To frame the issue. To frame the issue, okay. Well, um, hopefully your library has um, an existing set of relationships throughout the community so that, so that you're hearing and listening to what the community is talking about. Um, that's one way to identify uh, possible issues to focus a community dialogue on. Another, again, I'll come back to the partners. Um, the, the partners can, can add to your, uh, can add a perspective to your view that you might not have yourself. And then you can also, which, which we did in the example I just gave, we did do a survey. Um, now we were focusing in particular on the immigrant and refugee population and, and the receiving community and mostly in a particular neighborhood. Um, so we did do a survey to get to get input from residents uh, uh, for their thoughts on what a good topic would be. Um, of course, a survey takes resources too, so you can't, you probably can't um, uh, let the survey become a whole project uh, on its own. Um, but through, the, through that variety of, um, of methods, I think you can, you can get a lot of input and, uh, and decide uh, what topic to focus on. And I can add a little bit um, from our work in, in various communities. So I think it does depend on the resources you have. So 
you know, it might be like, like Richard said, kind of bringing the partners together, kind of, you know, uh, getting feedback from different community leaders, but also you can do, you know, survey. You, some communities have done uh, focus groups beforehand if they have the resources to do that. Having, you know, unlike the dialogues, it's more, you know, to just for the, the input and the feedback, but it does also pr help with community building. So you might have a focus group to hear from the community about the issues that they're facing. Um, and this is also a place where you can use kind of traditional organizing methods, so like door knocking um, to go out and, and survey community members. But um, like I said, I think that all depends on the resource level that you have. And so you might just want to talk to the people who, you know, the, that you have relationships with that have that knowledge. Great, thank you. So there's been some concern about um, how long the dialogue sessions take, four to six weeks of consistent involvement is a little bit of a big commitment for participants. So there's some interest in learning how you can ensure participants continue to actively engage with the groups and also being considerate for marginalized groups and ensuring that they can attend even though they have um, more barriers. So could you talk a little bit more about how you can ensure participation? Okay, um, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is what Richard mentioned was when they did the uh, immigrant work with Harvard Public Library is while some of our discussion guides go for six sessions, they cut it that down to four. So then that way it's less time on people's schedules. And also another thing that we do a lot or a lot of communities do is you know, you have different dialogues for different times of the day. Say if you have one dialogue circle may take place in the morning for people who work in the afternoon or may take place in the middle of the day for people who don't need to work or take place, you know, uh, about 6 o'clock or so after work hours for people who do work, you know, 9 to 5 jobs, things like that. So you can do that to have, you know, to accommodate different people. Also in terms of travel, and this is why it's important to have a coalition to provide resources, is um, one, you want to make sure that you're, uh, one thing would be making sure that wherever the dialogues are being held, is it on a bus line? And if it is on a bus line, if you do, you have are you able to provide people with bus passes or things like that? So then that way people can make it back and forth. Uh, another thing is providing you know dinner or some type of food for people when they are coming, you know during the lunchtime hours or during the evening hours, things like that. And I mean, there's also sometimes some natural attrition that does take place. But the key is to try to make it really involved so that way people do see the value in coming back. So to try to minimize that as much as possible. And that's the importance of, you know, when we're talking about using an equity lens, it's a way of how do you get people to the table and keep people at the table in a way that actually works for them. So taking all of those things into consideration in different lifestyles, that's what can help keep people going. And you know, dialogue sessions can be truncated, you know, uh, combined. Some people have even, um, you know, done two sessions in one day, things like that, or um, taking the two sessions, merging them and cutting certain pieces out. So there's different ways around it to make sure that, you know, if people, if, if you're hearing a lot of feedback saying six sessions for six weeks is just too much of a commitment, then there are ways around it. But, I mean, that, de that also depends on what is your community able to or and willing to do. And there's value, we, we kind of talk about the value of different formats as well, um, which we didn't touch on that much in this presentation, but for example, the, the four to six weeks um, does help with that relationship building because people are coming back, so over time they kind of build that trust. But um, we've also had a lot of communities that do this in a one-day process. Um, so the New York City example that I gave was a one-day summit, and that also can be really helpful. You get in that format, you might get all of those 100 people in one room, um, and they might, you know, go off to different rooms to have their dialogue. But one thing that's good about that format is that you kind of get the, um, the energy up. So people really see that, like, this is a big community effort, and they see all of those people together, you know, 100 people. And so it can kind of empower people to feel like they really are making a difference. Um, so there are definitely different formats. And then we also talk about how do you market this? So you know, by saying this is going to be four to six weeks, it might kind of put people off. But if you say, you know, this will be 10 hours of your time, mm -hmm. they might be more likely to commit to that. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, 
just to put some emphasis on the, the points that Sagacity and Milana just made, there, we, we presented the full um, process uh, using the full diagram, but there are ways to adapt this and modify it. Um, and really, in, in the whole field of dialogue and deliberation, there's not very much that is carved in stone. Uh, um, you know, seminar uh, or webinar number one in this um, series uh, done by NCDD to give an overview. And they have the streams of engagement, uh, the NCDD streams of engagement um, document that gives a great overview of many different processes. You know, they can, to a large degree, they can be, you can borrow one part from one and put it with another, or you can modify these processes. So, um, so I would say don't be scared off by, um, by what seems like really big investment of time and resources here. Uh, if you do the full process, it is. And there, um, uh, you'll get more benefit by doing that, doing it that way. But it doesn't have to be done that way. And and for those of you with limited resources, which is probably everybody, um, you may want to dip your toe in the water with a kind of a mini version of this first. And that could also serve as a as a demonstration po uh, project or a pilot project that could help you go get money to do to do a bigger process. Great, so we had many, many excellent questions in the chat box, and I'm afraid that we're running a little short on time. Um, would the folks at Everyday Democracy like to do a follow-up quick Google Hangout over the next couple of weeks to address the questions we were unable to answer? That would be great, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Then um, everyone can keep an eye out. We will email everyone that registered for this session the details of when that will be and um, with a link of how to get to it. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Milana to close us out and then to Mary. So um, just to close out, we have our contact information here for all three of us. and. Like I said, we do um, conduct trainings, the organizing training, the facilitation training, and the action planning training um, for communities who are interested in kind of do, going through this process. And you can also visit our website. And so the, the link is there on the slide. Um, there's a lot of great materials on our website. Some of the stories we talked about, some more stories, um, also some advice and materials that you can use on your own in your community. So, thank you all. Yeah, and I'll turn this back over to Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I want to uh, just do a few more housekeeping uh, notices uh, before we wind up. But first of all, um, I'm, I'm I think I, the stream of questions, the tremendous volume of questions about this um, belies a lot of interest, but also um, really reveals, you know, sort of how complex this process can be, what is involved. Um, but as Richard said, it is something that can be adapted um, to your purposes. I think if you dig in to the resources on our um, ALA.org LTC website, you will find many tools there. And as the uh, previous, I'll go back to that slide, um, the folks from Everyday Democracy are tremendously accessible and uh, truly nice and want their uh, process to spread and grow and be fostered and are very interested in working with libraries. So please feel free to reach out to them or uh, any of our staff with the Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative at ALA with questions um, about any of this. Uh, we got into some really meaty um, processes here, but ones with tremendous, tremendous potential. So I am so excited also, just to shift gears a bit, to announce that registration is now open for our second learning series um, targeted toward academic libraries. I know there have been a number of academic librarians who have been taking part in this webinar series, and I suspect there will be many public librarians um, and uh, librarians 
from other types of libraries who are interested in the second uh, learning series as well. It will take place in the fall of 2017. The learning sessions will be targeted toward academic libraries and feature models from Essential Partners and the National Issues Forum. And you can go to ALA.org at LTC for more information on that. Um, I'm also going to ask you to please uh, complete the post-webinar survey monkey uh, so that we can learn from your experience and improve and keep getting uh, funding support uh, for the important, to support the important work that you are doing and um, taking on as libraries really expand this um, role in the models they adopt uh, for community engagement. And I'm going to once again uh, remind you all to please claim your badge. Um, claiming the badges, digital badges are optional. Um, and however, if you want to participate in the Everyday Democracy in-person training session in June, if you're registered for that session, uh, in order to participate, you must have completed all of the online learning sessions. And the way we can track your participation is through this badging system. The deadline for claiming your badges so that you are remain eligible for the workshop is Monday, May 15th. So, I have a slide up here with some instructions. Um, it really is tremendously uh, straightforward. You need to go to um, credly.com, create an account or a, uh, or a login, click on claim credit, enter this code LTC public three to claim your badge, and um, we will be able to see that you've claimed it and you can do all manner of things with it. I'm kidding, you can really only add it to your LinkedIn profile and perhaps some other things I haven't figured out yet, but um, we really appreciate your participating in um, this credly.com um, uh, link up that we've done. Um, and yes, I love that Samantha and Everyday Democracy reminded us that Richard Frieder, who was on this webinar today, will be one of the presenters and trainers uh, for the workshop in Chicago, so that's wonderful. Um, again, I have a link to the evaluation, the post-webinar evaluation here, and um, I would just like to thank you all so much for your excellent questions and for being with us today, uh, and thank you to our presenters, Sagacity Walker, Milana Rogers Burson, and Richard Frieder from Everyday Democracy. And our thanks as well to uh, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, to the Public Library Association, and to our Models for Change advisory group for their guidance, um, as well as our, my colleagues behind the scenes, Stephen Hoffman, Samantha Oakley, and Sarah Osman, for their wonderful support of this webinar and the Libraries Transforming Communities Models for Change initiative. This learning webinar has been a part of ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative, which addresses a critical need within the library field by developing and distributing tools and resources to support the work of engaging communities in innovative ways. Thank you all so much for joining us today.